Poštovani gledatelji, dobar vam dan i dobrodošli na treći dan konferencije PR and Media Days, koji je posvećen medijima u okviru teme popularna kultura. Prvo izlaganje imat će profesor dr. Marcel Danesi sa sveučilišta u Torontu na temu Representing Climate Change in Popular Culture, Past and Present. Hello, thank you very much for having me. It is a delight to be here. I feel truly honored and I will do my best to um, uh, encapsulate some thoughts that I've been having recently about climate change and its representation in popular culture media. Popular culture is something very difficult to define because anything that becomes popular at any point in time could be defined as part of popular culture. Um, so for, as a working definition, I will use the term popular culture to represent um, any text, any performance, any spectacle, any uh, form of language that is immediately um, understandable and remains among people as something to be discussed and enjoyed over time including something that expresses danger or um, such as, for example, climate catastrophes that have occurred from the beginning of time to the present time. So that will be my working definition of popular culture, namely that it has always existed, although never named as such, as something that is literally popular to audiences and therefore resonates with them with messages and meanings that uh, remain and can be transmitted across time. Okay, how have humans dealt with danger across time and across cultures? Our paintings on prehistoric cave walls, the first recorded images of danger and fear understandable by everyone, Our ancient flood myths, like the, flood, the myth of Gilgamesh or the, the myth of uh, Noah uh, or the story of Noah in the Bible, are these cautionary tales of human destructive activities understandable in the same way today as they were in the past? The difference with them would be that in the original versions, they were attributed to the divinities as punishments, whereas in current times, we would not do that. In secular times, we would attribute it to other factors, um, such as human destructive activities. Now, these are the kinds of questions that fall directly under the rubric of the semiotics of culture, can, which asks this question, can representations of the past provide relevant insights on current crises such as climate change and the rise of infectious diseases from the angle um, of how they are perceived and represented in language, in images, in stories, and so on and so forth. Now, this line of inquiry, in my view, may itself be a powerful one to suggest ways of devising meaningful social action to curb the destructive human activities and that brought them about. Now, this is a very large claim and it is more a suggestion than a claim. And if I can take a little bit of publicity time and say that I have actually collected these thoughts in a forthcoming book of mine called Warning Signs to be published by Bloomsbury. Sorry for this little publicity, but this is not coming simply out of a, a purely uh, speculative angle. I have actually studied it very carefully over the years. Now, from the early cave drawings and ancient myths and poetry, representations harboring warnings of impending doom and existential uncertainty are everywhere and abundant. There are more of those than anything else. Now, the point is that they resonate with us to this day. Um, and if they do resonate, and if they are still resonant with meaning, that means that they are part of a popular culture paradigm that has remained constant um, as part of our 
uh, how can I say, human unconscious or subconscious. In other words, these representations have always tapped into a common populist understanding of what danger is. Now, an analysis of climate change within this historically expanded view of popular culture would allow for a particular kind of framing of this phenomenon as an existential threat to human uh, civilization that has always existed from the beginning of times. The representations, the meaning of the representations have changed, but not the need for such representations. Um, in other words, the idea has always been how to formulate in effective language, images, narratives, etc., the dangers of massive catastrophic events that will convince today deniers and other skeptics by projecting them into the arena of the popular, which is understand making them understandable to everyone. That'll be the essence of my talk today. Existential dangers posed by floods, volcanic eruptions, and other natural phenomena greatly preoccupied ancient peoples, of course. And this can be seen by the fact that they inscribed their sense of dangers on cave walls or else recounted them in stories such as myths. And sometimes even imprinted them, as we, will see, as we will see shortly, in language forms such as riddles. Many of the early riddles were nothing but popular stories of danger or impending doom. Um, these images, these sign systems can, in a sense, turn the danger sense in all of us on or off as a manner of speaking. I don't like mechanical metaphors, but it's useful uh, to perhaps establish the paradigm that I'm trying to establish. Consider a hypothetical example of what I mean by this. Let's take a word label such as poison. And let us put that label on a bottle containing water, a harmless liquid. Now, those who come across the bottle would automatically interpret the liquid as harmful, even if this is not so. In effect, the label turned the danger sense on. Now, the same perceptual modulation can be seen with regard to existential dangers and other forms of representations, not just word labels, but paintings such as the scream um, and others. In other words, climate change, the danger can be turned on or off depending on how we represent it in the popular imagination. The term itself, climate change, is hardly a neutral one. We all know what it means. Well, no, we do not know what it means, I'm sorry. We know what it implies, but its particular meaning is determined by how that label climate change is, is taken into be. So, for example, uh, by changing the label clim to climate crisis rather than climate change, already we have different connotations and therefore a different perception of what um, the potential danger involved. Given the meaning of crisis as referring to a time of extreme difficulty, trouble, or uncertainty. I should tell you that it was um, the, uh, the, the, president, uh, the presidential candidate, Al Gore, who put this forth already in 2001 as, uh, uh, as a means, as almost as a, an instrument to get uh, climate activism started. And he was very successful uh, in doing so, although it didn't remain as such over the years. Now, the point here is that warning labels or warning representations guide the perception of danger in humans, activating or deactivating it as the case may be. Movies such as Contagion, which has become <laughs> recently a very popular one again, uh, are cases in point of how larger textual representations can turn that danger sense on or off. Um, so the microcosm and the macrocosm in this case are isomorphic in, in representation. Um, the same can be said with YouTube videos, uh, uh, movies of other kinds and so on and so forth. Now, 
Climatological events that have involved dangers, such as floods, volcano eruptions, have actually been the main subject matter of myths, paintings, poetry, and other semiotic artifacts of the past. I found this in researching my own book to be really a, a remarkable thing. We think of the past as you know, uh, myths, for example, in the Iliad or the Odyssey or legends of human stories and narratives. But within them, there is the sense of danger that is constantly being turned on. Um, actually, as the um, um, Karen Armstrong, a, a researcher in this area, she has observed that it could only be this way because the ancient myths were metaphorical attempts to describe a reality that was too complex and elusive to express in any other way. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, a legend of the laboon, L-A-B-O-O-N, which means the wave, the wave from the ocean that eats people. This is a, a legend told by the Moken, a tribal society that lives in the Andaman Islands in the Indian Ocean. According to a popular story, uh, legend, the Laboon, this wave that eats way people, which we would call a tsunami today, comes at specific times to cleanse the island of all evil and impurity. The story is a cautionary tale intended to prepare the islanders for tsunamis, guiding them to seek safety on higher ground. As a result of such uh, mythic warnings, records show that the islanders have, those islanders have survived tsunamis essentially unscathed, unlike the inhabitants of other islands in the same path of the same tsunamis who lacked a similar mythic legacy. Geologist Dorothy Vitaliano sees such myths as indirect records of real geological events that are passed on to subsequent generations as warnings, folkloric popul populist warnings of things to come. Her approach has come to be called geomythology. Now, let me give you another example of what, what geomythology is about. There is a traditional story told in the area surrounding the coast of Chile, which relates how two great snakes fought each other to see which one could make the sea rise more, setting off an earthquake and sending a great wave ashore during the conflict. The key to decoding this myth lies in the metaphorical, symbolic, if you like, geomythical interpretation of snakes um, in the cultures of the region. In the Chilean legend, serpents represent vehicles used by celestial gods, such as the sun and the stars, which allow them to cross the heavens in an unobstructed fashion. Any conflict among the snakes would imply a disruption of the vehicles, and this would cause upheavals in nature and human life. So to summarize here, myth, metaphor, artistic uh, representations, even folkloric rituals, and other form, these are the most common forms of popular expression of the past. They shape beliefs, beliefs about things, and they are probably the foundational structures for uh, not only rituals, but belief systems of a philosophical and even religious nature. Now, they have the capacity to turn the danger sense on and off. Um, and they are performed repetitively to neutralize or prevent anxiety with regard to the occurrence of some existential gain, danger. So how does this project it into the future? Well, I'm gonna use a little bit of the ideas of Roland Barthes who said that current day spectacles, popular spectacles, um, which we can see today in movies, in, uh, in, on internet, um, in internet memes and so on and so forth, are really recycled ancient myths and uh, representations. In other words, 
the surface of these new forms of representation, the language, the images, and so used, may be different. But if you look below it, the themes and the ideological structures are the same. So a goal of cultural semiotica is to determine if within the connotative range that a text covers, such as a myth, there is a meaning core to it. And if this meaning core can be transferred to the modern era and utilized in such a way as to make it effective. I'm not the first one to say this. Thomas Sibiak, the late um, great semiotician uh, uh, in America, in Indiana, actually wrote a report for the American government in 1984, <laughs> which showed how we can use semiotic resources to, to uh, ensure that meaning does not decay over time. And guess what he found? He found that the ancient mythological structures and languages are the ones that decay the most. And if you look at the way in which climate change is described today, it is filled with the same types of metaphors. War, we must wage a war on climate change uh, and disasters. That, I, I, which I will come to very shortly, is one of the most ancient of all metaphors that has guided representations since the beginning of mind. But let's consider some popular terms for climate change that are out there right now, including climate emergency, <laughs> climate catastrophe, climate chaos, climate breakdown, climate disaster, and so on and so forth. Now, the question that um, I certainly try to entertain is, are these effective in changing minds? The answer is not clear cut. Let me, let me uh, report on a, a relevant neuroscientific study in 2000, in 2019, which looked at the responses of Republicans, Democrats, and independents in the US in terms of several of these actual terms. And what they used, I find this fascinating, electroencephalography and galvanic skin response measurements to see how the subject were response. And here's what they found. The researchers found that the term climate crisis, as Al Gore anticipated, elicited stronger emotional responses than any of the other terms among all subjects, regardless of their political views. However, they also found that these were not strong enough among those who denied climate change as to preclude them from generating counter arguments. So is there some metaphor that might work rather than crisis? Let's turn to history. Consider a 12,000 year old Viking stone called the Ruk R O. Uh, Dierizis K. Runestone. It was discovered in 1832 near the town of Odishog in, um, in Sweden. The stone is a message written in the runic alphabet that was read obviously by everyone at the time over and over. It consists of a set of riddles, a riddles that show us, a, a, you know, the danger that is occurring on earth. One of them says, for example, I'll give you, I'll read the, rid the riddle. Um, which spoils of war, there are two. The spoils of war, there are two, which 12 times were taken uh, both from one to another. Now, what's the answer to this riddle? Well, the answer is the sun and the moon. Now, the riddle is a warning about the dangers to the environment, the sun and the moon, as a consequence of the war, that's what he calls spoils of war, that humans are waging on it 12 times the months of the year. The author of this um, riddle had apparently witnessed events that were harbingers of doom, a powerful solar storm that had colored the sky in dramatic shapes of red, of red crop yields that had suffered from unusually bitter cold summers and so on and so forth. Now, as an image, ancient image schema, 
The war metaphor is still used extensively today. It is everywhere on the internet. I documented it in the, in the discussion on climate change over, I forget now, I, I put this in my book, over 500 times in different cons. Now, my question becomes, as a popularized word that comes from antiquity, and as Sibioc had predicted in his study of ancient uh, mythologies, does it work? today. Well, the war metaphor springs from a poetic sense of reality, juxtaposing humans in a battle against nature. Of course, in the ancient myths, this war was guided from above by the divinities of uh, the uh, deus ex machina. Today, it is not guided by that, well, at least most of us believe it, but by some inner destructive force. And it is that inner destructive force that many of the movies or other representations that are out there today are, are describing our reactions to the world. Now, in a, in a 200, 2015 essay, the Canadian writer Margaret Atwood expressed the following relevant thought. It is not climate change, it is everything change. Her statement spread broadly through cyberspace at the time, becoming an online meme for a while. Atwood's main argument is the same one uh, of the one that I just made about the use of riddles, is that our poetic sense, and poets especially, should start being activated, turned on, because it is the deepest one hidden within us. <laughs> I, as an Italianist, I have always been um, um, a lover of the works of John Battista Vico, the uh, ne Neapolitan philosopher who said that <laughs> the origins of thought is in poetic logic, not necessarily just poetry, but our sense of things as being combined through rhythm, through sense, through a connection to the world. So in a sense, Atwood's response that we need a kind of poeticity to express our, our feelings or our, our, our danger is probably a very good one. Um, I should say that it, it's consistent with what Percy Shelley uh, remarked in 1821, and I quote, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. To interpret this in modern terms, it means that those who speak and are able to use a kind of rhetorical power can change minds. Whether that the, there is no, even if there is no truth. In fact, today, you could probably spin anything you want as a lie, and it would still uh, have effects if it is rhetorically powerful. Okay. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but another five minutes. I don't want to keep people too long. No more time. <laughs> Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay, I will, I, will, I will come to a conclusion. Um, I should say before I come to that conclusion that I, I looked at work in virtual reality. And, you know, the next form of popular culture, in my view, will be virtual reality. And let's call it an immersive popular culture where people just jump into the world and enjoy it as prepared for them. Um, I've been watching a lot of Korean movies <laughs> recently, and they, are, they have caught on to the idea that virtual reality may be the next platform for popular culture. And it is a very effective one. I'll put this aside. Now, that's my conclusion. My premise has been that a semiotic analysis of past and present representations of climate change are identical. The causes are different. In the past, they were ascribed to, not to, the, to the divinities punishing human actions. In the present, it is human actions themselves that are punitive of, of, of the world. So the deep structure of the representations is the same. So I believe, I firmly believe that analysis of these texts, of these representations, and then extracting from them general principles, uh, 
can help us actually be effective in fighting denial of climate change. If Margaret Atwood is right, if Tom Sebeck is right, if the ancient poets were right, it is the rhetorical force of some text that will probably, or I should say, hopefully change minds. The main aspects of this approach include one, examining the ways in which danger has been represented throughout history in different forms and media, from cave art and poetry to narratives. Two, gleaning from this examination common principles of representation that might reveal how people have perceived and interpreted danger throughout time. Three, using this analysis as a means to understand the sense of danger itself, how to turn it on or off. Four, suggesting ways to help solve the problems of effective communication with regard to current existential dangers. And five, putting forth concrete strategies for counteracting denial discourse. You have no clue how happy it makes a semiotician to say that semiotics may have a real world important practical consequence to changing the world. So to conclude, one thing that stands out, that stood out to me as I was doing research on this, is that even a cursory look at popular and populist danger representations across times, what emerges is the fact that humans have always consistently, with no exception, connected existential dangers to broader questions of human life. It almost as if we have, Throughout life, we have always lived dangerously and seen danger as part of our condition. From surviving the elements by devising shelter and inventing such strategies as diplomacy to avoid war and, famine, war and famine, human history has in fact been based in large part on sol solving problems of existential dangers. Semiotics fundamentally studies how life and danger are interconnected, at least in my view through the signs and text used since the dawn of time to express the meanings of danger in very tangible, understandable ways to many, many people. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Hvala profesoru Daneziju. A o popularnoj kulturi i semiotici govori profesor doktor znanosti Daniel Labaš sa Sveučilišta u Zagrebu. Dobar dan, lijep pozdrav svima i zahvaljujem organizatorima što su me pozvali da sudjelujem i da mogu nešto danas na ovoj našoj konferenciji o popularnoj kulturi reći i o odnosu popularne kulture i medija, zapravo masovnih medija u odnosu na tu popularnu kulturu. Kako bismo uopće mogli razgovarati o ovoj temi, na početku bih samo htio predstaviti nekakve osnovne pojmove i definirati ili barem postaviti pitanje mogućih definicija toga što je popularna kultura zapravo danas jest i kako ju doživljavamo i kako ju proučavamo. Ja sam se njome u neku ruku bavio sa kolegicom Mihovilović posljednjih deseta godina, posebno u okviru nekakvih semiotičkih istraživanja. Nešto ću vam kratko danas uspjeti prikazati u ovih desetak minuta svojega izlaganja ali u popularnoj kulturi danas govorimo kao o nečemu što je postalo temeljem suvremene kulture, posebno ove naše na zapadu, a njezini su izričaje, kažemo, postali dominantni u odnosu na one oblike visoke ili srednje ili niske kulture, kako to tumače drugi autori poput Danezija, Strinatija i drugih o kojima ste sigurno imali prilike čitati i čuti u nekim drugim prigodama. Naše zapadno medijsko društvo zapravo se svakodnevno koristi mnoštvom tih popularnih izričaja, kao što znamo. Dakle, bilo da je riječ o popularnom jeziku, bilo da je riječ o filmovima, o tehnologijama koje koristimo, o hrani koje doživljavamo ili nekako visokom hranom za elitno društvo ili onom koje je za obični populus, za obični narod. Govorimo i o tome da se i u modi, u sitkomovima, zapravo u sportskim prijenosima svugdje koristimo te izričaje kulture, a istodobno smo mi i proizvođa nekako stvaramo nove popularne oblike prema vlastitim potrebama i interesima. I o tome moramo voditi računa, dakle, 
da smo s jedne strane i potrošači, a s druge strane smo mi kulturni proizvođači popularne kulture i onda u korištenju i stvaranju tih njezinih oblika i izrišaja i mi sami pronalazimo, kao što nas uči Roland Barthes, s jedne strane ono tjelesno ili fizičko zadovoljstvo, a s druge strane ono duhovno, duhovno zadovoljstvo, da to tako kažemo nekako čak i onda i intelektualno. I o tome je dobro voditi ovaj računa. Dakle, kad bismo sad rekli kako bismo mogli uopće definirati popularnu kulturu, onda bismo morali priznati da ju je nemoguće definirati nekakvom jednostavnom definicijom, onom matematičkom formulom, jer se među teoretičarima još uvijek vode različite rasprave što ona zapravo jest ili što bi trebala ovaj biti. Pa se onda mnogi pitaju je li to zbog utjecaja recimo američkog hollywoodskog filma suvremena američka kultura. Što su zapravo njezini izričaji i kada se počinje uopće govoriti o popularnoj kulturi? Može li se ona danas izjednačiti sa ovom masovnom medijskom ili nekakvom folk kulturom? Ili je li to možda kultura koju stvara narod, dakle dolazi od populusa od naroda, ili je to kultura nekih dominantnih struktura koje se njome koriste za ostvarivanje vlastitih ideoloških i materijalnih ciljeva. Neke od teorija su dakle, u tom kontekstu onda kritične, druge nekako više prihvaćaju, akceptiraju ono što popularna kultura zapravo ovaj predstavlja. Nekako se onda čini da ju je najbolje opisati uz pomoć nekih njezinih osnovnih obilježja. Bilo da je riječ o spektaklu kao obilježju, bilo da je riječ o pružanju zadovoljstva koje sam već spominjao, bilo da je riječ o progresivnosti, društvenim promjenama, o nekoj kontradiktornosti u toj samoj popularnoj kulturi, a puno se polaže dakako i na značajku emocionalnosti i nekakvog raskida s tradicionalnim normama i vrijednostima, što je isto tako dobro dobro ovaj, e, znati. E, pita, pitamo se jednako tako i zašto je danas uopće važno razumijevati popularnu kulturu. Pa evo, ja sam ovdje samo kratko zapisao da s obzirom na to da kulturni izričaj sam po sebi ne može postati popularan ako ga društvo, ako ga mi kao društvo ne prihvatimo i ako u njemu ne pro, pronađemo određeno zadovoljstvo, onda možemo zaključiti da su popularni sadržaj svojevrsno zapravo ogledalo težnji, mojih i vaših težnji, mojih i vaših vrijednosti, stavova našega društva u kojem postaju popularni, ali da su i odraz trenutačne društvene zbilje, ali i našeg društvenog okruženja. Pa vas evo samo pitam, pitam sebe, pitam i vas, što nam primjerice govori činjenica da su evo kroz neko vrijeme među mlađom populacijom bile jako popularne i možda još i danas jesu serije poput South Parka ili Džakasa. Što nam govori činjenica da su tinjeđerice diljem svijeta bile zaluđene serijom knjiga i filmova Twilight Saga ili da je Avatar najprofitabilniji film svih vremena. Dakle, to su samo neka od pitanja koja opravdavaju potrebu proučavanja popularne kulture i u ovom našem kontekstu o kojemu govorimo ovaj danas. Za nas je, ja sam to tako nekako htio reći i mislim da je i za ovaj simpozi zapravo značajna definicija kulture kao načina na koji stvaramo smisao o sebi i svijetu oko sebe svijetu oko nas. Dakle, praksa dijeljenja značenja o nama samima, svime se time bavi semiotika, o drugima i svijetu koji nas okružuje, kao što kaže story. Dakle, naglasak je ovdje stavljen na razmjenu značenja, a prema tomu je onda kulturu moguće doživljavati kao svojevrsni obrazac, kao mapu značenja, kao kod prema kojemu dekodiranjem značenja oblikujemo i svoj vlastiti pogled na svijet. Zato tekstovi suvremene popularne kulture i prenose se masovnim medijima danas i na taj način svakodnevno dopiru do različitih društvenih skupina koji ih onda u odnosu na cijelokupni kontekst u kojem se dekodiranje događa na određeni način interpretiraju, odbacuju, prihvaćaju i dakako prerađuju. Sad, Idemo korak dalje i onda dolazimo i do samih semiotičara. Ja ću danas izdvojiti i na kraju pokazati primjer Ronala Barta, za kojega ste svi čuli, o kojemu svi puno znate i puno ste čitali. Dakle, oni naglašavaju zapravo ulogu popularne kulture u prikrivanju interesa moćnika, kaže on, i recikliranju duboko ukorenjenih značenja zapadne ovaj, kulture. Pri čemu onda to dekodiranje značenja zapravo ovisi o mojem i vašem svakodnevnom životnom iskustvu, ali i o stupnju našeg obrazovanja, o našim kulturnim normama i konvencijama, o našoj užoj društvenoj sredini u kojoj se krećemo, 
ali i o našoj obiteljskoj tradiciji ili geografskom području u kojemu živimo, o vrsti medija kojim se značenje prenosi ili ga mi koristimo, isto tako o medijskom žanru, spolu, dobi, vjerskoj, političkoj oprijedeljenosti ili rasnoj pripadnosti i tomu slično. Dakle. Zato ćemo reći da prilikom analize popularnosti nekoga oblika popularne kulture u obzir treba uzeti više tih navedenih ovaj, čimbenika i uključiti ih. Evo, kako bi, se to, kako bi se mi što bolje snašli u moru tih popularnih značenja i zadovoljstva koja nas svakodnevno okružuju, onda bismo kao osvješteni pojedinci, kao potrošači, rekli smo, ali ujedno i proizvođači popularne kulture, trebali kritički promatrati njezine oblike i brojne izričaje i osvijestiti procese njihova kodiranja i dekodiranja. Kao što se u ovom primjeru kojega vidite, dakle, netko jako dobro na naslovnici časopisa poigrao sa filmom 50 nijansi sive, a ujedno je htio evo nekako upozoriti na 50 nijansi Grčke, a znamo da je to bilo povezano sa velikom krizom, gospodarskom krizom, u kojemu je američka kance, pardon, njemačka kancelarka Angela Merkel odigrala jednu i tekako važnu ovaj ulogu. Dakle, evo, tu vidimo zapravo na koji način dolazi i do novih izričaja popularne kulture i kako mediji mogu u tom meta jeziku utjecati jedni ovaj, na druge i prenositi nekakve slične sadržaje. Zato nas Marcel Danezi upozorava na činjenicu da se semiotika, osim uobičajeno na kulturu, pa i na popularnu kulturu, onda može primijeniti i na film, i na kazalište, medicinu, arhitekturu, ali i na druga područja i da nas tamo dovodi do zanimljivih rezultata. Možemo proučavati komuniciranje životinja, možemo proučavati našu neverbalnu komunikaciju, estetiku, retoriku, vizualnu komunikaciju, mitove i naraciju, a u odnosima s javnošću i odnosima s medijima ima jako puno narativa i naracija. Dakle, možemo proučavati i sve ono što nam omogućuje da svijetu dajemo, vraćam se ponovno na tu tezu, dekodiranjem da svijetu dajemo značenje i smisao. I Evo, kroz ovaj primjer, na koji način možemo svijetu davati značenje i smisao, možda ćemo najbolje vidjeti na primjeru ovih mitologija i mitologije o afričkom vojniku u francuskoj vojsci o kojoj piše Ronald Bark. Vjerojatno ste knjigu imali u rukama, vjerojatno ste ju pročitali. Ja samo želim podsjetiti dakle, na to kako u sjajan semiotički kontekst Bart stavlja s jedne strane mediji, to je naslovnicu jednog časopisa, ali ujedno i stvaranje značenja u određenom kontekstu i u određenoj, u ovom slučaju, francuskoj kulturi. Bar piše, nalazim se kod brijača, pri ruci mi je jedna novina, par izmeć. I gledam naslovnicu. Što vidim na naslovnici? Vidim mladog crnca, ima na sebi francusku uniformu, oči su uzdignute prema gore i on pretpostavlja da gleda prema francuskoj zastavi, prema naboru, dakle, na tri kolore. I kaže on, tu je sve značenje slike. To je ono što i mi kao gledatelji, kao čitatelji, kao pratitelji tog časopisa, a da nismo francuzi, vidimo. Međutim, kaže Bart, bez obzira smatra li vi, li vi to naivnim ili je li to doista naivno, ja vrlo dobro kao francus razabirem što to meni znači, francuzu. Dakle, meni ova fotografija govori o tome da je francuska veliki imperij, kaže Bart. Meni govori da su svi njezini sinovi ravnopravni i da zato mogu služiti bez diskriminacije i bez obzira na boju kože, dakle, pod njezinom zastavom. I ono što ja kao Francus vidim, kaže Bart, vidim da nema boljeg odgovora kritičarima takozvarog kolonijalizma od revnosti koju ovaj crnac pokazuje služeći takozvanom plaćitelju. Međutim, Bart, kao dobar semiotičar i dobar čitatelj konteksta i značenja, dodaje ono što je ključ odgovora i ključ načina na koji se stvara značenje u kulturi. Kaže on, ja u ovoj naslovnici kao i vi vidim primjer propagande. To je proizvodnje ideologizirane poruke i preteću onoga što danas već svakodnevno gledamo na sustavnom proizvoditelju takvih ideoloških igara. On kaže televiziji, a mi možemo dodati novinama, radiju, televiziji, reklamama i internetu.
da je tomu tako i da se svijet nije promijenio, nego da je zahvaljujući suvremenim masovnim medijima ta proizvodnja popularne kulture ušla u našu svakodnevnicu i da je ima jako puno, govore vam evo samo neki od primjera. Ja se inače jako volim baviti ovaj reklamama i dekodiranjem različitih reklama. Ja vam ih sad nemam vremena ovdje sve skupa dekodirati, ali bacite malo ovaj oko na ovu reklamu Kelvina Kleina za džins, pa razmislite na koji način ona govori o našim društvenim odnosima danas, bacite reklamu na visoko popularizirane i popularne Dolce Gabbana i sve njihove ove proizvode, bacite na nekakve cipele šuster i vidit ćete zapravo da ove reklame stvaraju nova značenja i da iza njih zapravo preko jednog narativa progovara mit i ideologija o muško-ženskim odnosima u našemu ovaj društvu, a koriste se nekim starim narativima koje ja i vi prihvaćamo na svoj osobit e, način. Zato ćemo reći dakle, da zahvaljujući semiotici koje i sadržajima koje vidimo u medijima, mi možemo prepoznavati, možemo čitati i možemo sami stvarati nekakva značenja u kulturi. Evo jedno od značenja ili jedno od tema je i ova popularnost i nekakva slika ljepote u današnjoj popularnoj kulturi. Što je lijepo, što je ružno. O tome vam sjajno piše Umberto Eco, ako još niste čitali njegovu povijest ljepote i povijest ružnoće, Preporučam svakako da uzmete u ruke i da vidite zapravo kako su mediji stvorili takozvanu ljepotu potrošnje u 20. stoljeću, a ona vrijedi sigurno i za ovo naše 20. i prvo stoljeće. Zamislite samo stereotipi u ljepote i onda sjajne odgovore na to kojima se onda služa oni koji se ne slažu, da bi samo jedan ideal ljepote trebao postojati u našoj popularnoj ovoj kulturi. I pritom, evo, za kraj nemojte zaboraviti. Ako nam je veliki semiotičar uh, uh, Charles Sanders Pierce rekao da je čovjek znak, da samo i ja i vi znak ovdje u univerzumu različitih znakova, dakle, nemojte zaboraviti da nam je Thomas Sibio onda lijepo objasnio da smo mi glagol interpretirati. Dakle, ako mislite da ste glagol, onda znajte da ste vi glagol interpretirati i da svatko od nas kao pojedinac i kao društvo interpretira sve oko sebe, pa sam ja evo pokušao kroz ovih nekoliko primjera interpretirati i neke primjere iz popularne kulture i pozvati vas da interpretirate značenja izričaja popularne kulture u ovoj našoj medijskoj kulturi u kojoj danas živimo. I za kraj želim zahvaliti na slušanju i svima vama zaželjeti uspješan i plodonosan nastavak naše konferencije. Lijep pozdrav svima. Treći izlagač u sekciji dolazi nam sa suorganizatorskog Međun Plymouth sveučilišta. John Dean O'Keefe i tema The Killing of Jamie Bulger and Enduring Media Neurosis. Hello. Children who commit crimes and serious violence for better or for worse have always been a topic that have both uh, repelled and fascinated the general public since time immemorial. Just what motivates young children to commit unspeakable violence on others? Is it nurtured? Can we simply blame faulty parenting? Perhaps it's more general family factors or the children's environment, IQ, personality, society in general, the media, or indeed a combination of all of these, and perhaps even a lot more besides. One thing is for certain, we, the public, simply cannot get enough information about these children whom we believe to be at best feral or at worst evil incarnate. We blame the media for exploiting human suffering, but we, the public, are the very reason such exploitation arguably occurs. The media cannot be blamed for glamorizing unspeakable depravity. We, however, arguably can by feeding this particular monster. One such case where media and public have and continue to engage in a feeding frenzy surrounds the killing of one little boy in Merseyside, Liverpool in 1993, two-year-old Jamie Bulger. A quick history of what happened on that fateful day 
in February 1993 is now opposite. Jamie Bulger was from Kirkby in Merseyside and he was abducted in the New Strand Shopping Centre in Bootle on the 12th of February 1993, some 28 years ago. He was taken when his mother had briefly looked away from him by Robert Bobby Thompson and John Venables. They were both 10 years of age at the time, and indeed they were friends. They took him on a journey of some two and a half miles, ironically to the train station and train track behind Walton Police Station, where he was to be eventually found. He was physically and almost certainly sexually assaulted by one or more of the two boys in the most horrific manner. He was seen by some 38 separate people, but only two challenged the three boys as they went on that fateful walk. Without going into the full horror of what happened on that day, it, the, Jamie was punched and kicked by both boys. Almost certainly it was Robert Thompson who literally dropped him on his head on the canal. At the railway tracks, he was kicked, he was stamped, and he was beaten by both boys who threw in almost biblical fashions stones at him. John Venables indeed threw blue paint over his face. His trousers and underwear rem were removed. Finally, the two boys dropped a 22 pound bar on him. Now they were tried as adults later in that year and found guilty of murder. They were thus, thus the youngest murderers in British legal history. They were sentenced to be at Her Majesty's pleasure and the parole board made them subject to a lifelong license but release at 18 with full anonymity following an ECHR ruling. Many questions arose from this case, not least the media ones. But one of the issues that arose was, was this case premeditated? It would certainly seem so. They had talked in previous weeks about getting a boy or a child lost. On the day that Jamie was abducted and murdered, they were seen observing children. They were seen selecting a target. Two weeks earlier, Venables was seen to do the same. They truanted it on that day and they stole paint. There was evidence that John Venables, at least of the two, had seen a movie called Child's Play 3, which involved a psychopathic doll called Chucky, a horrific movie, which it was said at the time they had replicated on the day and started to create a huge discussion around the influence of computer games generally and their effect on children and particularly child violence. The injuries to remind ourselves to Jamie Bulger were truly horrific. There were many, some 42. The pathologist could describe none as the fatal blow. The two boys then left him on the track to make it look like an accident, an oncoming train ensured that the boy was sadly cut in two. But the mauling soon began with the press. It didn't just begin with the press. It almost never does, isn't that right? Judge Morland, who was the judge presiding over the trial, he bowed to public pressure and he named the boys. A very unusual thing to do. He branded them as guilty of unparalleled evil and depravity was the way he phrased it. The floodgates opened and what we all know to be a moral panic ensued. The politicians rode in. They variously described the boys as nasty little juveniles, hooligans, worthless and evil. Outside the court, the case had to be moved from Liverpool and held in Preston. Outside Preston Crown Court, Hundreds of people screamed for the two boys' lives and they threw stones. The media headlines at the time were unbelievable. The Daily Mirror called them freaks of nature. The Daily Star said, how do you feel now, you little bastards? The Sun said the devil himself could not have made a better job of the two friends. And so it has continued between 2001, their release, and 2021, which we are now at. The media has operated a frenzy. Every moment, every second of their lives, everything they do, every word they allegedly say, they like to put in print, and more importantly, we like to read it. 
John Venables and Robert Thompson, how were they created by the media and how are they still described by the media? Well, at the time, there was a distinction created between the two. John Venables on your left there, more of a lamb. Robert or Bobby Thompson on your right, more of a wolf. But these were media creations. And when we look and prosecute the backgrounds to these two boys, we don't see a lamb. We don't see a wolf. We just see two boys. John Venables first is worthy of thought. Like Robert Thompson, instability marked his background. His mother and father both suffered from depression and an on-off relationship. All attention was focused on his learning disabled younger siblings. Apparently, he was subject to uncontrollable rages and behaviours at school. This was noticeable, even in a school which had a certain amount of social and familial dysfunctionality. He meets Robert Thompson and they validate and perfectly complement each other's behaviours as normal. Very much like the Millwall Football Club mantra, no one likes us, we don't care. And so they came to be. There is an argument about both John Venables and Robert Thompson that they both had unconscious cries for help ignored amidst the continuing humiliation and abuse of adult power. But John Venables has been in the media since he left prison for the last 20 years and up to very recently. In 2001, it was alleged as he left prison that he had had sex with an adult female worker at Red Bank. In 2002, it was reported he was having a relationship with a woman whom had a five-year-old child. It was also reported that he had lots of young girlfriends. In 2010, the media were not finished. They reported that he was in prison, released from prison on license over extremely serious allegations. Back in prison and released again in 2013. In 2018, he was sentenced to 40 months in prison, allegedly, for thousands of category A, B and C images of children. The media would never leave John Venables alone. And then we have Robert Thompson, whose childhood picture is on the right hand side. Unsurprisingly, turbulence defined his childhood, a classically dysfunctional family. His mother, Anne, was beaten senseless by her father. And then she goes on to marry Bobby Sr., Robert's father, at 17 years of age, who does the exact same thing to her. She has seven children and he leaves them all completely. He too, as it turned out in reports, had been abandoned. So there was zero love and affection in Robert Thompson's household. He was constantly trying to please his mother. He too was displaced by his younger brother, Ryan, and all was invested in this newborn. And then a new baby, Ben, is born. The mother overdoses and on it goes. Odd behaviours, including sucking his brother's Ryan thumb at night, could be seen with Robert Thompson. And yet no one sees any real dysfunctionality at school. He's a cool customer, like all the family. He too, he's betrayed by his father, he's ignored by his mother, and he's bullied by his older brothers. There's no evidence of an urgent impulse to violence until, of course, he meets John Venables. And then we had a movie called Detainment by the author Vincent Lam, 30 minutes long. It was nominated for Best Live Action Short Film for the Oscars a couple of years ago. Denise Bulger, Jamie Bulger's mother, said she was disgusted and upset and got over a quarter of a million signatures to have it removed for Oscar consideration. It wasn't, but it didn't win an Oscar. The Home Secretary's advisor at the time, Malcolm Stevens, had said that the whole issue raised very important questions about young offenders, which he says many governments have striven to avoid. Vincent Lamb, who produced and directed Detainment, he said he wanted to bring some shades of grey into this whole case. But essentially, as with the Yorkshire Ripper and other horrific crimes, a moral panic had and is still being created around these, these two boys. And I find myself in full agreement with commentators when they say 
that, that this is a serious and moral piece of work. Where to now, though, for the hungry media? Of course, as we all know, there is this distinction between what is in the public interest and what the public are interested in. And if ever we wanted to see it writ large, we see it in the case of Jamie Bulger. When it comes to both John Venables and Robert Thompson, both in different ways have and continue to feed a media driven by atavistic demands for revenge. And they have been set up against each other by the media. John Venables considered to be the vulnerable, shy, but completely unpredictable child in the corner. Robert Thompson, his friend on the other side, the cool customer, the leader of the pack, the psychopath, if you will. Then we hear in October of this year, only last month, reported on Wales Online, John Venables is not dead. Officials quash rumours about James Bulger's child killer in Wales. Thousands of social media users were speculating that he had been the victim of a hammer attack. Speculating. 28 years later, people are still speculating about what is happening to these two boys. Now, of course, men in early middle age. John Venables is clearly a hate figure, a sex offender who will always hate figures. Now the media have something concrete to hang on to. Robert Thompson's case is slightly different, and yet even he is managing to feed into this media frenzy. He said at his parole board meeting, I do not feel that I am now a better person. I do feel I'm a better person and have had a better life and a better education than if I had not committed the murder. How do we think that plays with the media? It plays with the media in the same way it plays with the general public badly. Here's somebody who is saying he has benefited from the most horrific crime. The media will not let this go. He says there is obviously an irony to this, but it's part of my remorseful feelings as well. I am deeply ashamed of what I did and of having played a part in this horrible murder. Again, it's conditional. He played a part in this murder. He didn't cause the murder. He was only one element to it. He has completely diminished the crime in those words. And that diminution, of course, has been taken up by the press and will be taken up by the general public. And the press will report more on Robert Thompson now, and the public will be more interested in reading about public about Robert Thompson's public and indeed private utterances. What the public is interested in, he also, however, detailed his traumatic childhood before the crime, stating that at the time he was completely out of control because my life on the streets was better for me than my life at home. The media will probably not report this, and if they do report it, they will report it in a mocking way. The public is not interested in his poor upbringing, in his dysfunctional background, because for every one of Robert Thompson and John Venables, there are another 20, and those 20 did not commit any crime, let alone the horrific crime that we are talking about here today. And yet the cruel reality is that however much the media, fueled by an insatiable public, pursue John Venables and Robert Thompson into early middle age to atone for their sins, two indisputable facts remain. We will never truly know why both these boys did what they did on that day. And more importantly, no amount of press coverage of the event or the murder will bring two-year-old Jamie Bulger back to his family who loved him so much. May he rest in peace. Thank you. Memories from my bedside, a case study in teaching empathy to journalism students, tema je koju nam predstavlja Mike Baker, također sa Plymouth Mersion Sveučilišta. Hello and welcome to my presentation. Uh, my name is Mike Baker. I'm the programme leader for journalism at Plymouth Marjon University in the UK. And today I'm going to be talking you through a case study which we did uh, a couple of years ago, which I'm still kind of uh, gathering data from and, um, and really deciding what to do with. <laughs> I've presented this at a couple of conferences now, really uh, two well, journalism educators mostly as, as a kind of case study um, in 
what I would call teaching soft skills to journalism students, one of the issues that we find is that these soft skills, which are actually really important for journalists, uh, are quite difficult to teach, partially because you can't really do them in a classroom. And we talk about them a lot, but actually to evidence them is, is quite difficult. So for uh, empathy, which is what I'm going to be looking at today, you could read all sorts of other things, such as curiosity. I think curiosity is one of the absolute fundamental skills for journalists. And how on earth do you teach that in a classroom? <laughs> I'll come on to that another time. I've I've done some uh, experiments with with our students really about teaching curiosity to them um, with varying results so uh, maybe one for another time on this on this particular platform also uh, ethics I'm really interested in how we teach ethics to students in real life settings again not easy to do um, you have to put them in situations in which they can exercise ethics and again that, that throws up all sorts of issues especially if you're doing uh, some research with them so Anyway, so this particular case study is looking at empathy and by which I mean uh, applied empathy, but also effective empathy. Again, I'll come on to explain what I mean by that. But the really overarching element here is how we get students to understand the feelings of others when they're writing stories about them, when they're engaging with them. Uh, and, and try not to other people. There's a, there's a tendency for journalists quite often to, uh, you know, look at it, look at an interview or look at getting a story as, as kind of simply a transactional process. I want something from you. It's quotes or it's a story. I go and get it and then I move on. Uh, and that isn't always the best way to behave for a journalist. It doesn't always yield the best results. And it can often cut you off from follow up stories, which, again, is a, a kind of a staple for journalists in this in this well actually always it's been a case that the follow-up story is quite often the better one so uh, this came from uh, kind of by accident like most things really um, the initial idea was that I'd been looking for ways in which we could put our students in situations that they might uh, learn skills of self-direction uh, self-control uh, you know independence those kind of those kind of really important skills for a journalist. Um, quite often we engineer situations in which things go wrong for the simple reason that you learn more about your abilities as a journalist, as a person, when you're dealing with things that are going wrong. So this was just a kind of extension of that. And uh, just a happy coincidence came along. Um, one of the doctors at the hospital, which is right next to Marjan University, uh, had contacted me asking if there was a way that we could use our journalism students and their journalistic skills to to capture the stories of his patients uh, because he was finding that especially in elderly care which is where he worked the the patients were quite often engaged with staff in a way through stories um, which which really interested me anyway I'm, I'm really interested in storytelling again a kind of fundamental of journalism and so I jumped at the chance to um, to involve our students in that and as a result of that it's kind of I did a bit of research around uh, effective empathy and applied ethics and how our students, you know, how we might teach that to our students. And the two things just kind of came together. So here was a perfect opportunity for them to practice their storytelling skills. Again, key journalistic talent, uh, key journalistic um, undertaking, but also for me to place them into a situation in which their empathy skills and ethical skills were, were going to be tested. And in a way, it felt like because the patients were giving freely of their stories, their experiences, and we weren't going to turn these into anything, I guess, journalistic in the sense we weren't looking for a story as a journalist might. It felt like this was a situation I could control and we, we could be careful and but sensitive with the stories we were being told. It was also a really challenging situation to put our students in. So again, there was a lot of risk assessment involved, as you might expect, um, and and a lot of work. It took a lot of work to set up, uh, but I think in the end it was worth it. So initially, uh, I had worked with our speech and language therapy students um, in terms of the psychology of of having difficult conversations. These patients were in not end of life care, but certainly in elderly care. 
and it was important that we uh, understood the nature of the stories they were recounting to us. A lot of them had lost their significant partners in their life. Most of them were women, but there were some men uh, and, and had lost their husbands and wives throughout time. And, and the stories they were recounting, the memories from their bedside they were recounting were really personal, um, but also really interesting, <laughs> has to be said, uh, and, you know, and also historical moments. You know, they were they were recounting their history of Plymouth. So again, it felt like we were doing something quite important here. Um, as I mentioned before, this was this was my opportunity. I viewed it as to challenge our students, but in a, in a managed way. They wouldn't be completely on their own in the wards. They were going to be managed by ward the ward team, ward sisters. And so I wasn't completely cutting them adrift, uh, but certainly I wasn't present. The, uh, the And some more thoughts really were, were coming from Derriford, the hospital, which was they were hoping to learn from our students and the skills that we have, we teach our students about interviewing um, as a kind of primary tool for training their staff in that self same skill, so they don't talk of it as interviewing. But when you are dealing with patients on a on a long term basis, you get to know them, and we were really looking for a way to help them create uh, relationships, I suppose, with their with their patients, so they might they might give them better care. And one of the ways we were looking at sort of exploring was was this idea of interviewing a journalistic kind of skill of interviewing i.e getting information out of people in a kind of soft way uh without them realizing they're giving you information so uh without wishing that that sounds bad when i say it but that was that was a a real kind of key driver for the from from the hospital's point of view um before we were able to get going we had to talk to the students a lot about old age about the effects of loneliness and, and also what that does to your mental health, being in hospital for a long time, being in a hospital bed for a long time. It was, there were, there were lots and lots of ethical issues, quite apart from the, our treatment of these people's stories. It was more about uh, me arming the students, I suppose, with a kind of ethical toolkit, but also preparing them for hearing people's very personal life stories. And again, you know, we, we, we took great care in preparing the students before we let them anywhere near the hospital. Um, again, from a, from a health and safety point of view, but also, you know, the, the, I, I wanted them to get the most out of the experience as well. And if they, if they were affected unduly by it, then I don't think they would have done. And then finally, it sounds awful again to say this. Um, we talked about them getting the story. So the one key journalistic driver, I suppose, from, this particular approach of gathering stories was that ultimately what we were going to do was turn the stories into podcasts for a much wider audience for people to to hear across the city really we wanted to get involved in all sorts of projects uh, this is a kind of a oral history of Plymouth which is exactly what it turned into and as a result of that you the, they would need to edit and produce these pieces of audio and in doing so uncover the story and I th that's how I kind of squared this off from a journalistic point of view was that that was what I expected of them and I and I left them to that so they they did the interview they conducted the interviews and from those interviews they unearthed I suppose the key storylines and then presented them as you would editorially, so I guess in inverted commas, most important first, and then on from there. But a lot of these were, you know, chronological narratives, so it made it quite tricky. But that was the kind of journalistic challenge that I set them. So uh, this is how it was going to work. They arrived at the hospital, uh, introduced themselves as journalists. That's a key, again, another key element that we talk to them about legally. They have to identify themselves as journalists when they go onto hospital grounds. Uh, they were then met by senior staff. They were assigned their own patient who had, it's important to point out, uh, been told about the project, signed consent forms um, and understood what we were doing with their with their, with the content they were going to help us create. So again, there were ethical issues there for us to consider. And then we basically spent about an hour, all the students did, um, beside them. They were in bed. The student was sitting down. 
uh, and effectively just recorded an interview. In, and again, this is another an ethical issue for journalists when people that you're interviewing know you're interviewing them and understand what that means. And again, it took a little while to explain to some of these patients that's what we were doing. A lot of them absolutely volunteered and, and were, were very eager, really, to, just to talk to someone, I think, which is which is another element of this. But we, we had to be really, really certain that the patients knew what was happening. Um, and so, again, that, that it took a little bit of time to kind of to just to make sure that everybody was on the same page, I suppose. And then an hour or so. It was never an hour. It was always much longer than an hour. Um, their, 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 their task really was to edit the content, find a top line. You know, that was my journalistic challenge, like I say, and then to, turn that whole thing into into 10 minutes, roughly 10 minutes. Um, and again, we had a chat about a two hour, an hour and a half, hour, two hour conversation and turning that into 10 minutes. Again, there are kind of there are ethical issues there again in terms of treating that content sympathetically and again I think that's really important for journalists understanding that that people uh, open themselves up to journalists in a way that they might not to other people and so there's a tremendous responsibility there on the part of the journalist so uh, another really key skill that that is just like being learned uh, as a sort of attendant benefit here in, in undertaking this exercise. So yeah, we could have just sent them out to interview any old people and gone through this same process. But uh, I was really interested in in charting and challenging them to consider the, how empathy was affecting what they were doing as journalists and whether or not that made them make good or bad decisions. Uh, but also, you know, this, this idea of, of being sympathetic, which I think is often lost among certainly young journalists in the pursuit of the story, there's a time and a place for that. So I just wanted to present to them a kind of counterpoint of of that very tabloid, the 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 keen as mustard young journalist looking for their big break. You know, that's not journalism as I see it. Isn't always all about that. So that's kind of how it happened. Um, here, I hope you can hear. Just uh, I'll just play a brief example of one of the um one of the podcasts that came out uh obviously this is this has been turned into a podcast so initially you'll hear um the intro that, that we played so here it is hopefully you can hear this i'll turn my i was sitting in the coach my brother was sitting there i can remember it so clearly and um my father was tapping on the window for me to speak to him and the more he tapped the more I turned my face away I refused to speak to him because he was sending me away <laughs> you're listening to memories from my bedside a podcast series brought to you by Plymouth Marjorie University and Dereford Hospital this week I'm speaking to Audrey Barry Audrey was born in London in 1929 she shares an experience common to her generation up till when I was 44, I lived in London, but during the war, I was an evacuee to Cornwall. And I stayed for two and a half years in Launceston because um, uh, the government that was in power at that time when the war started, they wanted as many children to leave London as possible. And our school was going away, so my mother and father decided that I needed to be an evacuee, much to my disgust. <laughs> so hopefully hopefully you could hear that. Um, I can make these recordings available to you if you're interested in, in hearing them. So basically Audrey there was uh, a Londoner during the war, Second World War, and evacuated to the southwest near to Plymouth um, and recounted a story of, of being crossed with her dad on the bus when they were being taken away. So turning her face away and, and, and not talking to him. And, and Dave, uh, the, the chap's voice you heard there at the start, uh, was a actually a, um, an older student. So he'd had a career and had come into journalism and now actually works for uh, Citizens Advice, which is, um, I don't know if you have an equivalent, but basically uh, gives people advice on money matters and you know, personal finance, those kind of things um, as a charity. So maybe, I don't know, this kind of helped make his mind up about a second career choice. But uh, Audrey's story is really, really powerful, really, 
really interesting. We could I could have we could have gone on for an hour. You know, the whole thing really could have been played. I wanted to keep that discipline though, so they kept the podcast to ten minutes. Um, and the beep you could hear maybe in, in the background was was um, I think a dialysis machine that she was being um, you know treated as he was interviewing her. So a really really I guess unsettling but certainly unusual interview situation for the student. Uh, a quite uh, what's the word? I mean I, I guess a kind of disarming situation for the patient. You're in bed. You're in your night clothes. You know, it's it's a really unusual place to conduct an interview, if nothing else. And again, one of those other benefits, I suppose, from from projects such as this was just putting in lots and lots of random elements which the students had to deal with um, and not not consider. You know, just one of the things about being a journalist is the fact that you, you're put into lots of strange situations. You just have to deal and, you know, make the best of what the situation throws at you maybe your equipment fails maybe someone refuses to talk to you maybe you're thrown out by security uh you know and again these are i suppose soft skills of journalists how you deal with situations that you're thrown into and again this was a really unsettling situation for the students and they came out really really well because i don't think we dwell too much on what could go wrong we really looked at we had clear outcomes in mind clear goals in mind and so we didn't really talk about what might go wrong and what you might do if this this and that goes wrong. I was really focusing on risk assessment for them and just making sure they were comfortable in that setting. Um, and like I say, the results, I think, spoke for themselves. But so in terms of results from the research, from the study, from my point of view, um, we captured the students' experience afterwards. We also captured the students, the um, the experience of the patients as well. And from, you know, anecdotally, the students all expressed um, an understanding and an acknowledgement that they they experienced effective empathy in the sense that the they showed empathy to someone that they, you know, they didn't know they, that they were someone's story. And they're generally a lot of these stories became sad. And so the students found themselves being empathetic towards the patients. And I think that's a really important skill for journalists. If you're going to tell people stories and people personal stories, then you need to understand and acknowledge when that's ha when that experience is affecting you and how it might affect you. They certainly got better at interviewing as a result. They, you know, if when something was mentioned by one of the patients, they were quite they got quite good at spotting that story. And again, it sounds wrong to talk a bit like that when it's something so personal, but you know that the, the idea of could you tell me more about that, uh, which again is a, such a key journalistic skill, they understood that in that real setting. And as as, as I mentioned, they, they they got to interview people in unusual situations. They they got to experience sensitive ethical issues in a kind of controlled way, which is really exactly what I was after. Um, we had lots of discussions afterwards about what that meant to them, uh, and and as a result of it, it completely. But as a sort of side issue, a lot of the a lot of the patients wanted to stay in touch with the students, um, and wanted to tell more stories, which was which was great for us. And also, you know, I mentioned at the start about the hospital staff. It certainly was was better for them to have watched this thing happen. And also, the patients had opened up at that point, and so you know they were able to treat them. And again, very anecdotally, they 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 found they were able to kind of um, give them better treatment as a result of understanding them more, which was a really important point for me. Looking back at the project, we couldn't really have hoped for much more than that. Uh, so this is just some quotes from uh, one of the students involved. Um, she admitted that she, she used to be nervous about interviewing people just in general. And so I think perhaps the idea of interviewing an elderly patient was perhaps easier for, to her, for her to consider than maybe someone from the council or an MP or someone. So it allowed her to practice those skills in a challenging situation, but also in a kind of quite comforting situation. Certainly she learned technical skills that were improved, um, built her confidence. She went on to become a, a, a print journalist. Um, and then to, to sort of finish off her quotes there, she, she said she always feels confident that she has the skills, compassion and professionalism 
needed to approach these situations. And I think by these situations, she means any situation. When you work in a, in a local newspaper, as she does now, that situation element, it, it could be anything. You never, you're never quite sure what you're going to be pitched into any day. So I think, again, this was a way of teaching our students resilience, I suppose, um, in a, like I say, in a controlled setting. Again, just to, to sort of um, finish off here, just some quotes from one of the doctors involved in the project. Um, he talks of, you, you know, having the resources to, to remind their students and healthcare professionals about interviewing, uh, talking to people, understanding people's stories and how that might Im improve and affect their care. And, you know, he, he definitely found a real mine of of skills and knowledge that he was able to pass on to his his students but also his the, the teams on the elderly care ward about just talking to people really how important that is and how important listening is when you're talking and then um just finally really this, this sort of student outcomes they produce some great work which you had a little bit of there um, they all gained independence and confidence. They designed a product. Obviously, the outcome was a, a podcast. So there were all those elements which went with it, the, the PR elements, the design elements, the kind of uh, identity of the podcast, all that stuff. Uh, we had planned a media launch. So they um, went through the whole process of publicizing uh, what was going to happen. They arranged all the press. We had it was a bit of a nightmare, but we got everything ready in the hospital. And then unfortunately, along came uh, COVID and a lockdown and it basically torpedoed the whole thing but it would have been a <laughs> would have been a great media launch I think had we been able to do it and and a really interesting story and I'm pretty sure it, it would still be going on today and probably across other hospitals using journalism students in this way and as soon as we can we're certainly going to go back and revisit this Ongoing research, uh, I'm still working with Derriford around this, about how we use the practical professional skills of, of interviewing in a, from a journalistic perspective um, and how they might capture patient information that is otherwise hard to, hard to gather. Um, I'm really interested in, again, using these interview techniques from, from journalists in different settings. It allowed us, I'd done a bit of previous bit of research um, through the Erasmus program about the codification of, of journalism and the journalistic method and this allowed me a little bit a little bit more I was able to add things like compassion and empathy and applied ethics to that toolkit that I'm uh, a kind of a, that's part of an ongoing research project of mine about how you codify journalism and journalism skills and it's allowed us to um, branch out a little bit. So I've used journalism students since in dementia clinics in Plymouth. Again, about capturing stories. Uh, certainly dementia patients offer a different set of challenges. But, you know, just as important really capturing those stories, even more so really for, for families, um, especially as you watch someone with dementia that's close to you. So, yeah, so there's been lots of outcomes. There's so much more research to be done. Um, from this one case study, as quite often happens. Um, I would say, are there any questions, but you can't ask them to me. Uh, so um, I'm sure if you do have any questions, then you'll be able to find my email address and I'd be happy to answer any you have. Um, but yeah, so hopefully you've enjoyed that case study from me and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Medijsku sekciju zaokružujemo predavanjem docentice doktorice znanosti Sarine Bakić sa Univerziteta u Sarajevu, koja će govoriti o popularnoj kulturi i kulturnom populizmu. Dobar dan svima. Ja sam docentica Sarina Bakić i dolazim iz Sarajeva, Fakultet političkih nauka Univerziteta u Sarajevu. I za ovu priliku ću kratko iznijeti e, svoje izlaganje vezano za odnose, odnosno suodnose popularne kulture i kulturnog populizma. Jedna od najrasprostranjenijih objašnjenja popularne kulture jeste da je to kultura koja je svima dostupna. Ili to je svakodnevna kultura, medijska kultura, koja preovladava u savremenom društvu. Ona predstavlja 
zajednički skup praksi i uvjerenja koje su stekle globalnu prihvaćenost i koje obilježava medijska dostupnost i pojavnost u obliku komercijalnih proizvoda. Sadržaj popularne kulture određen je dnevnim interakcijama, potrebama i željama, te uključuje različite segmente svakodnevnog života. To bi bilo prehrana, moda, do medija i različitih oblika zabave. U materijalnom smislu, popularna kultura je skup općenito dostupnih artefakata, odnosno široko dostupnih industrijskih zabavnih i kulturnih medijskih proizvoda. Premda je popularna kultura inherentna kapitalističkim društvima, nastaje kao sustavno organiziran način trošenja slobodnog vremena. Međutim, moć popularne kulture ipak nije apsolutna, kako neki savremeni teoretičari tvrde. U stvari, upravo upadljiva teorijska diskuzivna priroda popularne kulture, ali i različite ideologije otkrivaju i ograničavaju u stvari njene moći. Njen utjecaj se uglavnom svodi na mišljenje ljudi i to na racionalnu svijest, na govor kojim se ljudi služe kada pričaju o kulturi. Ta mišljenja i te racionalizacije međutim nužno ne propisuju i njihovu stvarnu kulturnu praksu. Čak bi moglo biti, možemo tvrditi, da dominacija normativnog govora ideologije popularne kulture, kakva je vidljiva najviše u medijima, raznim društvenim institucijama, obrazovanju pa sve do kritika kulture, zapravo kontraproduktivno djeluje na praktične kulturne preferencije ljudi, tako da oni ne iz, na, ne iz neznanja ili ti manjka istog, već iz samopoštovanja odbijaju ponekad da slijede naloge ideologija ili dozvole da ti nalo, nalozi određuju njihove preferencije. Populistička pozicija direktno opravdava to odbijanje, odbijajući svaku razliku između dobrog i lošeg i svako osjećanje stida ili krivice zbog određenog ukusa u popularnoj kulturi. Odatle postoji cinična dijalektika između intelektualne dominacije popularne kulture i spontane praktične privlačnosti populističke ideologije. Što su stroži standardi u nekim segmentima popularne kulture, više će biti smatrani nekom vrstom represije, a populistička pozicija će biti privlačnija. Ta pozicija, za razliku od ideologije popularne kulture, pruža mogućnost da se slijede vlastite preferencije i uživa u vlastitom ukusu, ma kakav on da jeste. To je dobro razumjela komercijalna kulturna industrija. Ona koristi populističku ideologiju za vlastite ciljeve, jačajući kulturni eklektizam koji je u njenoj osnovi, te propagirajući ideju da zaista nema razloga za ukus, drugim riječima, da objektivni estetski sudovi nisu mogući niti da postoje. Ona prodaje svoje proizvode sa idejom da svako ima pravo na vlastiti ukus i slobodu da uživa na svoj sopstveni i autentičan način. Zato i ne iznenađuje što je najčitaniji opis komercijalne primjene populističke pozicije popularne kulture dala još prilično davno grupa Frankie Goes to Hollywood koja glasi jedan od najvažnijih zadataka kulturne industrije nije toliko da se proda neki proizvod, koliko da da moralnu dozvolu da se uživa bez krivice. Međutim, populistička ideologija nije primjenjiva samo na ciljeve i interese komercijalne kulturne industrije. Ona je povezana i sa onim što francuski sociolog Bourdieu što je nazvao popularnom estetikom danas. Estetikom koja je čista suprotnost 
nekadašnjem buržuaskom estetičkom stavu po kome se umjetničkom artefaktu sudi po krajnje formalnim, univerzalnim kriterijima bez ikakve subjektivne strasti i zadovoljstva. S druge strane, u popularnoj estetici ne donose se nikakvi solomonski sudovi o kvalitetu kulturnih artefakata. Ta estetika je u biti pluralističke i kondicionalne prirode, jer se zasniva na premisi da se značaj nekog kulturnog sadržaja može razlikovati od čovjeka do čovjeka, od situacije do situacije. Ona se zasniva na afirmaciji kontinuiteta kulturnih formi i svakodnevnog života, na duboko ukorjenjenoj želji za participacijom i ono što je najvažnije na emotivnoj uključenosti. Drugim riječima, popularna estetika, znači estetika popularne kulture, drži do priznavanja zadovoljstva i toga da je zadovoljstvo prvenstveno lična stvar. Prema Bourdieu, estetika popularne kulture je duboko usađena u zdrav razum, u način na koji obični ljudi prilaze kulturnim formama u svom svakodnevnom životu, u svojoj svakodnevnici. Suvremeni kulturni artefakti uglavnom predstavljaju robe proizvedene i stavljene u opticaj radi financijske valorizacije kroz razminu i potrošnju. To se ne ograničava samo na popularnu kulturu. Artefakti takozvane visoke kulture su također zahvaćeni u proces kapitalističke akumulacije koliko god tradicionalisti željeli to da ignoriraju. Posebno je zanimljiva postmodernistička interakcija formi i značenja preko nekad strogo čuvanih granica kulturne vrijednosti i politike, kao i složeni odnos između simboličkih i materijalnih konfiguracija na nacionalnom, globalnom i lokalnom nivou. Nema više šokiranja ako se recimo studentima danas govori o tekstualnim privlačnostima i popularnoj privlačnosti recimo najnovijeg filma u kojem glumi pjevačica Lady Gaga, a koja se već nalazi u mnogim nastavnim planovima diljem svijeta. Nadalje, kada se govori o populističkoj kulturi u sklopu popularne kulture ili takozvanoj kulturi za narod, neophodno je uvijek identificirati njene ideološke elemente i pretpostavke, budući da o njenoj ideološkoj neutralnosti apsolutno ne može biti govora u savremenom društvu, pa tako ni u bosansko-hercegovačkom i u društvima regiona. Ovome se može dodati da je prožimanje kulture i ideologija rezultiralo da kultura, i to u prvom redu njena estetika, postaje bojno polje na kojem se biju bitke za ideje o društvu, državi, svijetu, vrijednostima i načinima života. Obzirom na to da današnja društva čini mnoštvo različitih kulturnih, političkih, društvenih, etničkih, interesnih, profesionalnih i generacijskih grupa građana, tako se umnožavaju i pozicije gledišta koje daju značenje pojavama, pa tako i pojavama koje kontekstualiziramo u popularnoj kulturi. Različite grupe, Različite ideologije, pa i pojedinci, neće na isti način razumjeti i doživljavati društveni svijet i svoje mjesto u njemu. Zato u svakom društvu, pa tako i u bosansko-hercegovačkom, postoji mnogo različitih kulturnih praksi, te se zbog toga niti jedan aspekt kulture ne može tumačiti kao jedinstven, kao monolitan, jednak i oslonjen na jedinstven svijet i jedini, usudit ću se reći, pogled na svijet, a koji je zajednički različitim klasama, polovima, uzrastima i naravno drugim kulturnim identitetima. Odavde proizilazi mišljenje da ništa u kulturi, pa ni u popularnoj, niti je prirodno, niti je spontano. Ako se popularna kultura svodi na konzumiranje reklama, gledanje reality show programa, čitanje tabloida, mijenjanje odjeće, mijenjanje stilova, miksovanje starih i novih hitova, recimo u muzici, različite aspekte horor i naučnih fantastičnih filmova, sapunica 
identifikacija sa zvijezdama MTV-a također. Onda postoji sasvim, postaje sasvim nejasno u stvari šta je danas kultura, o kakvom recimo mi otporu toj kulturi govorimo, o kakvom je otporu riječ i uopšte šta je pozicija ljudskog bića u toj neprekidnoj profileraciji banalnosti u temeljima, u temeljenoj na demokratiji popularne estetike unutar popularne kulture. U ovom konstantnom naporu da se ukine hierarhija vrijednosti, podjela na visoku i na nisku kulturu, zapadnu i nezapadnu, elitnu i popularnu, zvaničnu i alternativnu, kulturu većine i kulturu manjina. Promišljanja o kulturi su se našla u jednoj vrsti čorsokaka, pokazujući nedostatak volje da se utvrdi neka vrsta početne pozicije za koje bi se moglo danas u postmodernom svijetu jeli, donositi određeni vredonosni sudovi. Popularna kultura danas, kao područje takozvane slobode, postoje, postaje ujedno i sredstvo porobljavanja, a kulturni populizam može da se preokrene i vidimo da se preokreće u snagu različitih destruktivnih ideologija. U ovom kontekstu nemoguće je razdvojiti aspekt kulture, nadalje i aspekt ekonomije, niti je moguće, a kako to čine mnogi e, teoretičari apologete, povjerovati da se sloboda izbora događa na neutralnom terenu vrijedonosnih sistema, slobodnog takmičenja, čiji ishod ili pobjednik nije važan ili šta više da je unaprijed poznat. Sigurno je da određeni elementi popularne kulture doprinose demokratizaciji kulture i uopšte društva u cijelini, jer smanjuje e, razlike među društvenim grupama i slojevima i ublažava klasnu diferencijaciju. Međutim, istovremeno, ekstenzivnost i šarolikost popularne kulture prati i pasivni recipijent i njegov neaktivan stav. U ovom slučaju, mogućnost slobodnog izbora, kritičkog stava i selekcije ozbiljno su negirane, pogotovo kada je u pitanju sociokulturni ambijent Bosne i Hercegovine. Na ovaj način se oblikuje šematizovan odnos prema kulturi koja kreira kulturu za sve, ali ne i kulturu za svakoga. Kultura uopće je sve važnija u svijetu međunarodnog protoka informacija i zajedničkih formi popularne zabave, čijem razvoju su u mnogome doprinjele jeli, i nove tehnologije, to nam je već i kako poznato. Ključni zadatak nas istraživača jeste u stvari da nanovo povezujemo interpretaciju i razumijevanje naročito popularne kulture, zatim svoje kulture i drugih kultura, te da objašnjavamo strukture i procese koji ih rekomponiraju danas. Često se naglašava je li, u današnjim a, a, društvenim humanističkim naukama je li, multidisciplinarnost, koju ja razumijevam kao probijanje različitih intelektualnih barijera između različitih teorijskih disciplina i metodologija, a kako bismo se bavili izmijenjenim političkim, ekonomskim uslovima danas i kulturnim lokacijama. Multidisciplinarnošću mi u stvari širimo svoje horizonte, a ne sužavajući ih. To nam upravo i ova konferencija Filozofskog fakulteta Sveučilišta u Mostaru o popularnoj kulturi i kako dokazuje, a ja se još jednom zahvaljujem na ukazanom povjerenju, na pozivu da učestvujem uh, na konferenciji sa videopredavanjem i ja vas pozdravljam sa Fakulteta političkih nauka Univerziteta u Sarajevu. Doviđenja. Hvala docentici Bakić, kao i svim predavačima u medijskoj sekciji. Riječ prepuštam predsjedniku organizacijskog odbora, docentu doktoru Marijanu Primorcu, koji će predstaviti zaključke konferencije, čime ćemo završiti ovogodišnje šesto izdanje konferencije PR and Media Days Mostarijenzis.
Poštovani gledatelji i uvaženi sudionici, sve što je dobro brzo prođe. Tako smo i mi stigli do samog kraja ovogodišnje konferencije. Popularna kultura često se definira kao kultura koja je svima dostupna. U tom kontekstu PR i Media Day zamislili smo kao platformu koja čini znanje dostupnim i mislim da smo ovom konferencijom ostvarili taj cilj. Kroz ova tri dana znanstvenici i praktičari s područja komunikacija, sporta, medija i drugih znanstvenih disciplina prezentirali su nam svoje iskustva i omogućili dubinski pogled u fenomen popularne kulture. Kroz panel rasprave i izlaganja prezentirali i analizirali smo komunikacijske perspektive sporta, posebice nogometa kao od jednog od najzastupljenijih fenomena popularne kulture. Fokus je bio i na poveznicama između odnosa s javnošću, kulture i komunikacije, te načinima na koje popularna kultura i mediji utječu na naš svakodnevni život i percepciju suvremenog svijeta. Na temelju izlaganja i panel rasprava, organizacijski odbor konferencije otvrdio je ukupno šest zaključaka. Pa krenimo. Strateško upravljanje međunarodnim odnosima s javnošću temelji se na istraživanju i razumijevanju različitih kultura, kulturnih obrazaca, komunikacijskih praksi potrebnih za razvijanje interkulturalne komunikacijske kompetencije. Sinergija meke moći i planirane komunikacijske aktivnosti odnosa s javnošću olakšava državom prezentaciju svojih kulturnih vrijednosti i omogućava učinkovitije upravljanje nacionalnim imićom. Masovni mediji u popularnoj kulturi istražuju raznolikost načina na koji su mediji uključeni u naše živote u institucionalnim, ekonomskim, socijalnim, kulturnim i povijesnim aspektima. Mediji svojim produkcijskim sadržajima promoviraju popularnu kulturu, čineći pojedine njene komponente društveno prihvatljivima, poželjnima i očekivanima, tako korigirajući i mijenjajući društvenu svijest o određenim pojavama i fenomenima u suvremenom svijetu. Nogomet kao najveći sport na svijetu vrlo brzo prihvaća nove tehnologije. Navijački tokeni predstavljaju potpuno novi način interakcije između navijača i nogometnih klubova, stoga se sa sigurnošću može kazati da je budućnost u nogometu, ali u sportu općenito virtualna. Karakteristika koje film kao komunikacijski kanal nogometnih klubova može ispuniti su informativna, emotivna, dokumentaristička i marketinška, stoga ga treba smatrati važnim dijelom komunikacijske strategije. Kako dosadašnja prakša nalaže, unutar zaključaka najavljujemo i radnu temu za sljedeću konferenciju. Radna tema pod nazivom Sport, Media and PR Convergence. Na samom kraju našeg programa želimo zahvaliti svim učesnicima konferencije, profesorima, gostima i studentima, naravno našim suorganizatorima sve učilištu Merion iz Plymouta, članovima organizacijskog izvršnog odbora, našem sponzoru elektroprivredi Hrvatske zajednice Herceg Bosne, Naravno, veliko hvala i našim medijskim partnerima Večernjem listu, Federalnoj novinskoj agenciji, BHRT-u, SUM TV-u, Mostarskoj panorami, portalima Pogled 2, Dnevnik 2, Art Info, Media Marketing i SUM Sovo. Na posljedku, ostaje nam samo zakazati susret na našoj sedmoj konferenciji naredne godine. Do tada srdačan pozdrav od PR i Media Days Teama. Hvala. 